I wasn't expecting this set. <laughs> it doesn't not look like your apartment either. What were you expecting? I thought it was gonna be like your last talk show. Like I've got a new show, make it look like the one that got canceled. <laughs> Now, of all the guests I've had on this show, I've known you the longest. We've known each other almost 20 years. I knew you were a star the second I saw you. Was the feeling mutual? Um... <laughs> I'm sorry, but I don't remember the first time I saw you. It's okay. It's Here's been what a I remember time. about you. I thought maybe you were like... You were always very nice, but I was like, is he like a fraternity dude. Like, I wasn't sure, because we were, like, really young then, and then you would always wear, like, this blue Oxford. Yeah, it's funny, <laughs> I had to, people thought I was rich. My parents gave me a Brooks Brothers credit card. They're like, so when you have a job interview, you can buy a suit. And I was just like, yeah, I can't afford to do laundry. Oh, so that's why you go, always wore that? I would go to Brooks Brothers and buy new shirts, like, every couple of, like, months, and then just wear those all the time. But I had no money. I just had Brooks Brothers clothes. Interesting. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You grew up in Rockford, Illinois. Yeah. How much did that suck? It sucked. <laughs> Rockford was rated the worst place to raise a family by Forbes magazine. Really? Like, you can't even get a croissant there. There's... <laughs> <laughs> How does someone as cultured and refined as you are now come from Rockford, Illinois? Well, it's an act. It's aspirational. Do you or do you not own gloves that go all the way to your elbow? <laughs> Well, that's because I figured out if I was on stage and saying, like, mean things, I could, like, be even meaner if I was wearing gloves. I think of all of the actors that I've seen who have, like, transitioned into comedy, I gotta say you're the best one. Who are your influences comedically that brought you from acting to stand-up comedy? Well, in Rockford, I somehow got into the theater there, like a regional theater. You know what a regional theater is? Like community theater? No, it's like half professional actors and then half like delusional townspeople. <laughs> and so I somehow got to be the child in all of these productions. So I was in the theater like my whole childhood. So my influences, I would say early on, were I became obsessed with Neil Simon and I read like every Neil Simon play, and that was comedy, because um, I know you're not that cultured. I know who Neil Simon is. <laughs> and then I loved Miss Piggy. What did you love about Miss Piggy? I just thought it was funny, like she was glamorous, but like kind of street. Like she would like <laughs> kick your ass, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and then I really loved John Waters. What did you like so much about John Waters? Well, I thought it was funny, like, I would just hear him talk, and I remember he was saying he wished he was a woman, because then he could get an abortion. And I was just like, oh, you could, I'd love the idea of saying what you weren't supposed to say. Mm -hmm. I want to show you a clip of John Waters, one of my favorite clips. This is John Waters doing a non-smoking public service announcement that they would play in front of movies. Once movie theaters switched over from smoking to, like, you can't smoke, they would have the famous people do PSAs. Oh, right. And this was his. So, once again, no smoking in this theater. Mm. He's I, so cool. He's so cool. And the coolest thing about it is that they ran that in movie theaters. <laughs> um, you moved from New York City to Los Angeles shortly before the events of September 11th, 2001. I don't have a question. It just seems pretty convenient. <laughs> you know, I was actually cheating on a boyfriend I had the morning of 9-11. So I woke up <laughs> at a hotel room and I had like 45 new messages. And I was like, oh my God, like I'm so busted. <laughs> and then I was like, phew, it's just 9-11. So you were, you were relieved when you saw well, I didn't the towers know. come down. Obviously, that's just a joke. But yes, no, I, I, then I found out how, like, how serious it was. But it must have been a real scare before you found out about the terrorist attack. <laughs> Natasha, you, your stage persona is so kind of like precise and ice cold. Like, did you start out that way? Like, tell me about your first time on stage. Um, well, I actually did stand up kind of as a dare to myself. And I had such an amazing set that I had an out of body experience. The laughter felt like waves. Like, I, I had never felt anything like this before. And then I remembered my <laughs> hairdresser had given me like a half of a Xanax, and I had never taken pills before. So I was actually just on drugs. That helps some people. And then the second time I went up, I bombed. I remember the, my second time on stage, I had a panic attack. 
like a full-blown panic attack. I didn't know what was happening. Really? Yeah. I just remember like walking off the ice house open mic, going into the bathroom and just like covered, drenched in sweat, hyperventilating. It was like, what just happened to me? Well, Didn't I get on stage again for months. Well, I think what happened, probably the same thing happened, is we had a good first set. So then you get really confident. Exactly. And you're like nowhere ready to like really be. Yeah. I remember I had in my head for my second set, I was gonna tell everyone the open mic I was gonna be at next. <laughs> <laughs> so I was gonna be like, May 23rd at, you know, the laundromat on Virgil. Like I just, in the, I just ended up like totally eating it. Did you still tell them where you're gonna be next? No. I didn't have the tools to like even stay on stage in a bad set. And when you say tools, do you mean Xanax? <laughs> So in your newest Netflix special, The Honeymoon Stand-Up Special, it's like you do stand-up first, and then your husband Moshe does stand-up, and the two of you come on stage together? We roast couples. Let's take a look at that right now. So what's your name? Sebastian. Of course it is. <laughs> and what about, what about you? I'm Kat. Sebastian Kat. and Kat. And do you guys share a unicycle, or do you each have your own? You converted to Judaism for your husband, Moshe, wouldn't it have just been easier to marry someone else? <laughs> Am I supposed to answer these? Like, did you have to convert to marry him? No, honestly, him going to Burning Man every year has been much more of an adjustment. <laughs> I basically married into this, and now he's never missed a year. Like, even when I was pregnant, I went, one of the reasons why I had a baby with him is because I was like, now I'll never have to go to Burning Man with him. You've always seemed very Jewish to me, even before you converted. I mean, Judaism is just a superior religion. How so? Well, like, when I was young, I went to Catholic school my whole life, and, like, every time I would ask a question, I'd have to, like, go out into the hall. And, like, part of Judaism is, like, ask all the questions. Like, in the Talmud, like, their main text is in the middle of it is, like, rabbis fighting over, like, what's the right thing. You like rabbi fights? Well, I think it's stimulating. You're, like, talking about ideas and... I mean, I was raised Catholic, and I hated it, but I wouldn't overcorrect so much as to say that Judaism is good. So do you call yourself a Catholic? No. I, you know what, I call myself an apatheist. It's like, it's, it's an atheist, but you don't care if there's a God. It's like, I don't want to argue with you. I'm going to act this way no matter what. And if when I die, I'm in hell, so be it. I had a great time here at Good Talk.